Welcome to the Lorecast, where we look into the lore and the stories by which we live. I'm Dr. Craig Chalkwist, and you can find us at chalkwist.com slash podcast and at a number of other online venues. In this episode, we're going to address the question, do you really need to go back to school to get a PhD? And if not, what are some of the alternatives? So this is a question I get all the time. (laughs) I've been working in higher ed since 2005, steadily. And I'm constantly talking to people who are interested in the possibility of getting a PhD, mostly in psychology or something related to it. So my familiarity with this is from teaching and working on dissertations with students and being an administrator in higher ed, mostly on the psychology and humanities side. I have held a PhD in depth psychology from 2004, and currently working on a second PhD, this time in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. So I do know a bit about this, and um, it comes through admissions a lot too in the different schools I've worked at, which are several. So, the question, do I need a PhD? I would say that 9 out of the 10 people who ask me that do not and should not pursue a PhD. So let's start by talking a little bit about why you would need a PhD and what good they are. So, there's three main things that you need a PhD for. And the first two are the most important. The first one is, if you're going to teach in higher education in the States, you need a PhD. There are exceptions to that. So, for instance, you can have a master's degree and teach at community colleges, at least for now. If you want to teach at a college, at a university, you you usually have to have a PhD. So... Another way of saying it is, if you're on the path of the teacher of graduate students, you probably need a PhD. The second condition under which you would need a PhD is if you are looking ahead to a life of scholarship and you need to master scholarly writing skills, you want to publish peer-reviewed papers, you want to publish books, that are academic through an academic press in use in classrooms and you, you enjoy doing research. Now, just a quick note about that, on the humanity side of the house, research doesn't usually mean number crunching. It means collecting stories, looking through lenses of theory, comparing bodies of knowledge, Uh, sometimes interviewing people for qualitative research studies. So that kind of research, research that puts experience at the center, but done in a very disciplined way. So the path of the teacher in higher ed and the path of the scholar in higher ed, those are two good reasons for pursuing a PhD. That means that your career is going to include those in a big way. The third condition is if you want to publish, primarily academically. A PhD is not all that useful for publishing other kinds of books. And I noticed that when I got my PhD, when I went to publishing houses to publish, let's say, trade paperback books, I still got rejection notices, but now they said Dr. Chalkwist. (laughs) So, but still still not published, right? So at this point, I've published a lot, but I can't honestly say that the PhD has been terribly helpful with that. The exception is the academic books I've published. So my book on Terra Psychological Inquiry, which offers earth-honoring ways to do research of the kind I just mentioned. So Routledge picked that up. I, I think my PhD was helpful there. So notice that in all three of these conditions, the path of the teacher, the scholar, and the writer, what you're aiming for is an academic audience. 
If that's not what you have in mind, you really need to wonder why you're pursuing a PhD, especially in the United States. So let's talk about some of the downsides and what's really involved. And as part of this, let's talk about the story that you might be telling yourself about why you need a PhD. So first off, PhDs are expensive, especially on the psychology side of the house or the humanities in general. In the psychology programs that I have taught in since 2005, there is very little financial assistance. Most of the students I've dealt with do it through student loans, which means that you have one hell of a big debt at the end of your PhD studies and usually no clear career path. So I think it's, it's been a long time and the rules were always changing, but I think it's about six months after you graduate, you get the bill, right? And it's a big one. So that's something to really ground yourself in, no matter what story you're telling yourself about the PhD. I mean, those letters look really cool after your name and all like that. But what isn't so cool is if you don't have a lot of money at the end of your graduation and you get that big bill and it's the first of many years and years, right? So that's one thing to consider right off the bat. Second concern um, in terms of getting a PhD is that you have to have superior academic writing skills. And that means you have to not only be an excellent writer, but you also have to be familiar with different styles of citation because a PhD is an academic degree and you need to know how to cite people properly, how to gather up and refer to the sources that you draw on. And, you know, writing academic papers is not a matter of just coming at everything out of your intuition because you think your insights are really cool. They might be. But in academic work, you're engaging with bodies of knowledge that are related to yours. And so there are traditions to draw on and people to refer to. And you have to be an expert in the fields that you're dealing with. And that takes time and effort. So be aware of that. If you're one of those people with the attitude, well, I'm an okay writer, or I don't really enjoy writing very much, I would not pursue a PhD. It's a writing degree. Next, there's the, the dissertation, right? So they call it a thesis in Europe. Um, it's roughly 250 pages. It's a, basically a book. And it has a structured format. And it includes the dreaded lit review, which means you have to go back through the ancestry knowledge of your fields and be able to not only cite them, but to sum up the results. So now we're already talking about years of mastery, right? Um, you have to become an expert in the fields that you're dealing with. So in terms of writing the dissertation, it doesn't look that bad up front because some people finish pretty quick. I actually finished my dissertation fairly quickly. Uh, not even a year went by after classes stopped and I was done. I think it was nine months or something like that that I defended my dissertation. But for most people, it's years. And most of the schools that I've taught at don't offer a whole lot in the way of support. So you're pretty much on your own, you and your committee, your dissertation committee, which is usually composed of extremely busy academics. And it, sometimes the turnaround is weeks for getting any information out of them. So what I always recommend to dissertation students is that you find others and form study circles and support each other that way. But you're on a long road. And here's another thing. Um, if you're not self-directed, if you're not good at, at working on your own, you have very little chance of writing a dissertation unless you can afford tons of coaching. So that's another reason to consider not getting the PhD. Uh, lack of structure, lack of self-direction, and it takes time. So if you are really busy in your personal life, you need to ask yourself, where am I going to find the time 
to spend years, probably, working on a dissertation, researching, having going back and forth with the committee, receiving feedback, incorporating it, having my ideas change, having my research question change. This is a big dance, and it lasts a long time, usually. So are you ready for that? Academic rigor, that's a big deal throughout this whole PhD journey, yeah? So um, in terms of employability, it depends on the program that you're in, but most of the programs I've taught in uh, are either clinical programs which don't really require a PhD. You don't have to have a PhD to do therapy. Uh, you do to be a clinical psychologist, but then you might want to be thinking about a PsyD program. But in any case, most of the psychology programs I've taught in don't funnel into a, a career, an occupation, or anything like that. So that's something to consider too. Some of the students who graduate from these programs already have a profession. And others have a pretty strongly entrepreneurial bent so that they can just make it happen no matter what they are and have their feet land on the ground. Um, so if you're of that persuasion, then maybe it would be a good option. Otherwise, you need to think about it. Also, in terms of employability, uh, ZipRecruiter just came out with a study indicating that 93% of employers want to see soft skills on graduates' resumes. So they want to see relational skills, they want to see psychological skills, but they don't necessarily want to see PhD. So those are some reasons to be aware of the difficulty of this path, the path of the PhD, how much time and effort and work it takes. And what we should talk about at this point is the story that people tell themselves about a PhD some, sometimes. It's a degree with a lot of history behind it, a, a lot of prestige. Um, that's dropping, however, because uh, I think it's interesting that the word academic in English has a double meaning. Academic can mean involved in higher ed, but it can also mean irrelevant. Like when you say, that point's academic, right? So increasingly, higher ed degrees, especially the PhD, are seen as mostly in the realm of theory and inapplicable knowledge and pie-in-the-sky ideals and things like that. So PhDs don't tend to increase employability and not necessarily your reputation either. Now, um, sometimes we have this idea, and this comes under the um, kind of the category of reasons that people pursue a PhD when they're being honest with themselves. So what I've heard before from, from several students who want to go into a PhD program is, I've always known I was going to be a PhD. Okay, well, through much through part of my childhood and my early adulthood, I was absolutely sure I was going to be a clinical psychologist. I'm not one. I did therapy for a while, and it was great training for my real uh, career, but I didn't become a clinical psychologist. Intuitions can be wrong. And that's something that we need to realize. Uh, I have, as I mentioned earlier, pursued the PhD path. I've not only got one, but I'm working on another. But that's because I function primarily as an academic. I do always keep a foot in the real world, so I like to straddle the two and show up in both places. Because one of the reasons I'm doing these podcasts is that I believe that good knowledge should be available, life knowledge should be available widely. Not just in academia, not just bought through a tuition. So I'm interested in that. But for a long time now, uh, 17 years, I've worked primarily as an academic. I can see a point up ahead where that may no longer be true, however. So for me, it made sense to pursue the PhD. But for most people, it probably doesn't. So there's 
having those letters after your name, there's the fantasies that you might have about what life is like as a, as a PhD. They're similar to fantasies people have about getting published. You know, you publish a book. Um, I, I published a book through Routledge, which is one of the largest, maybe the largest social science publisher on the planet. I'm not rich. Um, I get a little money from them on occasion. I've published 15 books. They, don't, they aren't making me rich. So unless you're writing bestsellers and you have a really great agent in New York City, uh, the advice holds, don't quit your day job. You're not going to get rich publishing for the most part. Um, same thing with a PhD. It doesn't automatically make you employable or give you high status as a teacher or anything like that. So that's something to realize. So let's talk about some alternatives. I think most of the people who look for a good doctoral program to suit their needs in the kinds of arenas where I work, they're looking for other things too. So for one thing, they want some kind of a sense of kinship. They're looking for their tribe, so to speak. Um, a lot of people I deal with, a lot of students I deal with, were kind of different from where they came from more intuitive, more creative, more visionary, and they're looking for a degree that kind of says yes to that. But it doesn't have to be a PhD. There's plenty of really great master's degrees out there, and if you already have one, why not have another? Uh, yes, there's the expense. That's always something that you should have your eye on. But a master's degree is way less expensive in the States than a PhD. So some people are looking for a, a deeper or more holistic kind of education in higher ed, which is great. Um, some sense of deep community. Um, maybe you're transitioning from whatever it is that you do in your day job to being more of a healer or a mentor or a change agent. And some people do it because they're answering the call of the world and the time. They want to be able to do something effective in a turbulent time. Some people pursue a PhD for fulfillment and self-realization. They want to cultivate a sense of purpose or join a meaningful tradition. And what often goes unspoken is that in some cases, what they're really seeking is an enchanted wisdom path. They, they want to know how to live. Who doesn't? But they want to live in a way that brings joy, that lights up the world. So those are great reasons to pursue something, but they're all terrible reasons to pursue a PhD, frankly, for the simple reason that I mentioned earlier. A PhD is an academic degree. It's a research degree and a teaching degree. So what are the alternatives? So I mentioned master's programs, lots of good ones out there. Some pretty holistic, adventurous ones, too. I work in some of them. Uh, another alternative that's even more affordable is certificates. You can get them anywhere. I have certificates in mythology because I, I haven't found a myth program that I really want to sign up for. And I certainly don't want to pay more tuition than I already have. <clears throat> so certificates are a good way to go. If you're interested in ecotherapy, there are... There are programs, I'm thinking of my colleague Ariana Kandel, she's got a certificate, um, Jen Edelstein at Holos Institute, she offers a certificate in ecotherapy. Um, there's a new ecotherapy certificate uh, offered by Linda Bazell, my friend and colleague. And there's certificates on lots of different things. So picking those up actually looks substantial on your resume if you've got employment somewhere in mind. Or if you just want something to put maybe at a website that shows that you have credentials and training. Potential employers, whether they're individuals or businesses, want to know what you can do. They want to know what skills you've acquired. And increasingly, they care less and less about what academic degree that you have. So that's something to be aware of. So master's degrees are an alternative to the PhD. Uh, certificates are an alternative to the PhD. Lots of good ones out there. Um, it looks impressive, by the way, when you see a resume, whether it's online or printed, 
and somebody says certificate in this, certificate in that, and there's a bunch of them, it tells me as, a, as somebody who's done hiring that this person's serious about acquiring skills. And certificates tend to be more skill-oriented anyway. Less about theory, more about application. So you might consider that too. So there's another alternative that I want to put out in the world. It's brand new, although I've actually been doing it for many years. But as an alternative, it's brand new. And it involves creating a new profession. And all of those adventurous questions I mentioned before, for me anyway, it answers them. So I'm going to be doing a future probably a whole bunch of podcasts on Laurology, L-O-R-E-ology, and how to become a Laurologist. And to say a little bit about that right now, because it's what I do for a living, a Laurologist is somebody who helps us get straight about the guiding stories that we use, because that's how we navigate through life. We think we use facts, but we really use stories. And even when we collect facts, there's always the question of, well, what do the facts mean? And that is where a story comes in. The brain tells stories naturally. There's research that shows that we're all the protagonist in our, in our own story, if not the hero. Stories are a frame of orientation. Um, they provide a kind of life philosophy, a practical embodied life philosophy. And notice that where we get stuck in life is where we turn a story into something rigid and confining and literal. So I must do this or else, right? So then it's not so much a story anymore, it's a personal ideology. And with it comes conflict and suffering. So what Laurology does is it takes literalisms like that and it turns them back into lore so that they can enchant us. It looks at the, the myths and the archetypes and the underlying plot motifs and the dramas and and the things like that that are embedded in our guiding stories. What's under the hood? Where's the magic? Where's the enchantment? Why are these things charged for us, numinous to use a psychological term and a religious term too? So Laurology looks not only in on the stories that we personally tell ourselves and the whole question of, are these stories too confining? Is there a way I can deepen my story and expand my story? And whether that's the story of who I am and where I come from or the story of what I want to do on this planet for the rest of my life or how do I relate to other people and so on. But Laurology also recognizes that the big stories that we have as groups even entire nations, those determine a lot of our behavior. So can we tell more spacious stories that help us imagine possibilities for living on this planet that can move us forward in ways that are humane and ecologically wise? The idea here is that belief, which is a sort of literalized, fixed story, is really less important in terms of motivating people than belief in, right? So in terms of the speculative fiction Terrania cycle that I'm working on right now, just for fun, and to put some of these ideas out in the world, you know, do I believe in, for instance, the dream veil, which is what I call the unconscious, the collective unconscious? Um, no, I don't literally believe in it. I made it up, or it made itself up in my imagination. That's probably more accurate. But I believe in it. I, I follow Jung in his idea that the figures of the imagination are real. They just have their own kind of reality. And they can speak to us and inform us and mentor us if we're willing to listen, if we're bold enough to lend them an ear. So Laurology asks, how can we, instead of talking about pathology, psychological pathology, which we is psychology's borrowing from medicine, how can we talk about healing from stories that no longer serve us anymore? 
how can we imagine the motifs and the archetypal themes that pop up in our ancestry and our, our family legacies that get handed down, usually unconsciously? What are ways that we can tell stories about those that are liberating? How can we reimagine place, the presence of the places we live in? There's a whole field that does this now, Terra Psychology, T-E-R-R-A Psychology. That's an aspect of laurelogizing as well. So my aim in all this is to take what I've done professionally under different hats and actually turn it into a profession that other people can be taught and go on and teach other people. And when I fantasize about this, I imagine a sort of um, a guild or a collection of people who like to, to wield storytelling magic. Because I think we need less information these days and more inspiration. Less doom and gloom and more reasons for carrying on and building the kind of world that we want to live in. So that's uh, the big goal of Laurology. So if you're interested in any of that, contact me and we can talk about how to get you involved. I'm setting up some classes that will cost a lot less than tuition. <laughs> and um, as part of that, a certificate program and not offered through any higher ed institute, although that I could do that. There's a couple that I've worked for that would be willing. But I'd rather offer it on the strength of my own professional background with my name on it, and I'll stand behind it. So that'll be available down the road. But for now, we can have some discussion about what do we want this profession to look like? What can we do with it? So, after all that, if you're still thinking about getting a PhD, just to briefly recap, if you're headed into academia, then by all means consider getting a PhD. You'll probably need one. It'll be expensive if you get it in the States, unless you're doing it in a program that receives some kind of really good government assistance or, or a scholarship money or something like that. Most of them don't. Psychology programs tend not to, for instance. The alternatives, master's degrees, certificates of various kinds, and of course, uh, putting together a new profession if you're interested in that. But by all means, do something that will empower you instead of leaving you in a precarious position. Very often, people who lead with intuition and imagination and vision, as Jung pointed out, Carl Jung, they tend to be weak when it comes to what he called the sensate function, which is the bottom line, how much does it cost, how many years will it take to complete, how much time do I have to spend on this, and so forth. So if you're caught in visions of having those three letters after your name, then I recommend accessing your sensate function and really sitting down with the hard realities. And once you've done that, then come back to the question and ask yourself, for what I have in mind down the road, do I honestly really need a PhD? Thanks. <laughs>